afternoon, and welcome to the Institute for Advanced Study. Um, if you are not already on our mailing list and would like to be, please sign up right over there. And if you are on our mailing list, then you will have gotten in this week's listserv um, a little announcement saying that we're taking, we're doing a small <coughs> survey about our Thursday presentations. That is, whether we should continue to have Thursdays at four, or whether we should be moving Thursdays to three thirty. We've had some anecdotal requests. Well, anyways. Um, so, the reason I have our website up is that if you um, didn't notice the announcement on our listserv, it is actually right here on the front of our webpage. If you go right over here, it says search this site, go to the, the mini survey, and it really is a short survey. And I would ask all of you if you um, ever intend to come to Thursdays at 4 again, if you would just please go and fill this out. Very, very short survey, and we will be most of the time. Um, and, all right, And I am very happy to announce that, no, that's not right. Yeah, I know, you should have come here right now. Okay, here we go. <coughs> okay. We have one more Thursdays at 4 left in the series that will be next week. Um, as uh, uh, some of you may have heard last week, our uh, original speaker for next week had, um, for uh, personal reasons, had to cancel. But we are really, really excited that we're going to be hearing from um, most of our current residential fellows about the work that they've been doing here this semester while they've been at the IAS. So I hope you will join us next week for um, short presentations and then discussions from our residential fellows. Um, but for this week, we are really pleased to uh, be hosting Paul Cobb from the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm going to invite Michael Lower, who is one of our fellows this semester, to um, introduce Professor Cobb. Michael? Yes, thank you so much to IES for making it possible for us to bring in such a wonderful visiting speaker. We are super excited to have him. So, Paul is a professor of Islamic studies at the University of Pennsylvania, way out on the East Coast. He's been shuddering in the cold all day long here, and his umbrella was not strong enough for our rain. Um, so, we've given him a brutal introduction to life in the Midwest, but uh, he's still still ready to go here, and he works on the interplay between the Islamic world and Western Europe, and especially uh, in the medieval period, and as a dimension of that, he does a lot of amazing work on the sort of Islamic perspectives <coughs> on the Crusades, and I think that's what he's going to talk about us about today. So he has made some amazing contributions to this field. In a way, he's sort of helped create this field out of, out of whole cloth. Uh, it's a remarkable accomplishment. Um, so he works particularly on this amazing guy who lived in the 12th century named Usama ibn Munkid, uh, who wrote this very, very beautiful reflection on the sort of the vagaries of fate and human destiny, but which also happens to include this remarkable, maybe the fullest account that we have from an Islamic perspective of the Franks who came to settle in Crusader Syria in the 12th century. So it's a remarkable document, and Paul has written a biography of Usama, which is really, really beautiful, but then also, and this is the just incredible contribution to scholarship and especially to teaching, he translated Usama for Penguin Classics. And so now it's a beautiful Penguin Classic, Islam and the Crusades, Usama ibn Munkin's Book of Contemplation, and so now people who teach the Crusades, like myself, actually have this substantial document that we can give to students. And I just can't, uh, can't underestimate what an enormous contribution to scholarship and teaching that is. But wait, there, there's more. Um, so he's also recently written, and this is the book that is conveniently for sale right outside, um, written a, a beautiful history of the Crusades from an Islamic perspective called The Race for Paradise, which came out from Oxford University Press in 2014. 
and he's, he's not resting on his laurels. He's got a couple of new projects in the works as well. So he's got this very interesting project that I'm looking forward to hearing a bit more about. Um, the story of a sort of young man from Germany who was taken prisoner in the wake of a crusade in the late 14th century and then wound up from captivity moving on to sort of serving in the courts of all these very distinguished uh, Islamic rulers in the Near East and sort of his experiences, uh, which I'm really looking forward to finding more about. And then um, he's also got this really cool project called uh, Travel Tips from the Middle Ages, which um, <laughs> I hope he's going to stick with. We're going to hold his feet to the fire on that one. And this is something I think you'll be able to read eventually, and you'll, you know, you'll kind of not be so upset that you're sitting in the middle seat in your, in your airplane, right? <laughs> Once you read about the travel tips from the Middle Ages. So he's got a lot of projects on the boil, and we're so glad that he could take some time to come and talk to us today, Paul Cobb. <laughs> History and the Targets of Medieval Holy War. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you to the uh, Institute for Advanced Study, to the uh, Center for, Medi uh, for Early Modern History, Medieval Studies, Religious Studies, and the Department of History, who've all, uh, in some way or another, um, uh, pitched in to get me here. So um, thanks very much. I've, I've, been ha I've been having a wonderful time, despite the weather. And Michael and I uh, spent a, a memorable half hour or so, like a couple of medievalists over uh, some uh, Portland atlases uh, in, um, uh, in the library, in the rare books room today. It was uh, uh, a, a, an absolute treat, um, which you will find nowhere else. I was going to talk today about um, uh, the sorts of things um, that Michael was mentioning um, about Islamic perspectives on the Crusades, um, but then I decided to, um, I mean, I can do that if you want, but uh, uh, I do that a lot, and I, I thought I would uh, take advantage of the situation here, of the community of scholars here at the Institute for Advanced Study, and also UMN's uh, rather distinguished cohort of, of medievalists, uh, and try and get a little something out of it for myself, but also to pitch something that might be um, uh, of interest to uh, us all. Um, that is a, a subject which deals with Islam and the Crusades, but also with um, the writing of history, hence the subtitle of my, of my paper. Something that um, it's important to remember, uh, Christians and Muslims on all shores, of, and Jews for that matter, on all shores of the Mediterranean were doing when writing about the Crusades, about conflict and encounter um, in the Middle Ages. Uh, it came about, this, this idea came about because writing about Islamic perspectives of the Crusades is um, a fun and exciting topic, and it, it, it's very interesting, for, for example, for me to um, meet with my colleagues who tend to work from the European side of things when writing about the Crusades, and to, find, to sort of uh, compare notes, the different versions of events, and uh, the strengths and weaknesses of our sources. But what, what, what we find, what I find often, is that we're often speaking, speaking um, in parallel tracks, that our, our different perspectives often don't meet, that there will be conflicts in utter conflict in terms of how an event is understood or described from the sorts of little details that medieval geeks like me worry about, like dates and names and things, but also broader interpretations, the significance of an event. So it's as if occasionally our sources seem to be talking past one another. So I thought it might be useful in this exercise to step back, one step back a little, and um, to uh, see if there isn't some sort of common thread beyond the, the level of events, the details, the nitty gritty of our sources. Uh, what are the larger themes that our medieval authors are writing about? Is there any common ground there that, there, that Christians and Muslims and Jews are writing about? Uh, that suggests a kind of shared community, a shared body of ideas, of historical ideas that they're engaging with. And I did find, I, I was led to find some common themes, and that uh, reading chronicles, these chronicles together as literary texts could lead to somewhere interesting. I'm still not exactly sure where, which is why I'm uh, presenting it uh, in this fashion. 
I don't, I'm not particularly into questions of borrowing or influence. I, doubt, I really doubt that's at play here, as you'll see as I get going. But into a broader exploration of the whole human project of writing history in the Age of Crusades. This era is so marked by conflict, encounter, and rival claims. So I began reading widely, primarily in chronicles, but really any extended narrative that purported to describe the past, and primarily in Arabic and Latin, the languages I mostly work in, though anything available in translation is also fair game, for example, for this exercise anyway. For example, I'm still collecting more and more data. Uh, the the um, Hebrew texts of the, the Rhineland narratives, uh, which describe um, uh, the massacres of the uh, Jewish communities of the Rhineland during the First uh, Crusade um, are of direct relevance to this paper. Now, being attentive to literary questions while reading histories is not exactly news in medieval studies, but I am ashamed to admit that in Islamic studies, uh, this idea has really only caught on in any like, significant way in the past 15 years or so. So what I'm trying to do is to introduce a literary approach so common to medieval Western studies of Crusades, uh, or medieval Western historiography, uh, sort of that worked out by people like Gabriel Spiegel and people like her, to the larger world of Islamic historiography. Historiography being the, the study of the writing of history as opposed to the study of history itself. And likewise to show that the study of medieval Western historiography could learn a few tricks from the Islamic world, too. So I'm trying to get the two worlds to talk to one another. Uh, to do so properly, one would have to do an in-depth study, ideally, of one scholar or tradition. And some scholars have done this before, like Spiegel or like Taibul Hibri, who works on um, early, early medieval Islamic history. Or a comparison of, say, two or three periods or topics, um, as some scholars have done. That is, for this setting, sort of impossible. Uh, it's the kind of thing that you do for a, a seminar or a lifetime. Um, and anyway, I'm not the person to do it. Uh, maybe Michael is. I keep volunteering him for, for difficult jobs. Uh, instead, I'll just provide what in Philadelphia we call a for instance, uh, and some, some instructive examples to provide you a sense of the historical worldviews that are at play. And in contemplating these examples, I wish simply to make two general conclusions um, about history and history writing in the medieval Mediterranean. Uh, let me call my show up. Here we are. First, a historical point. Uh, I hope will be abundantly clear. It sh uh, what I'm doing shows, I think, that medieval Muslims and Christians shared concepts of history and the means of expressing them that were, in fact, much more similar than either party would have cared to admit, and that modern historians are generally inclined to, to ever recognize. Second, a historiographical point. The this first point about shared concept concepts highlights, for me at least, how cautiously we must use these texts as sources from which to reconstruct an accurate understanding of the events they describe, especially as independent sources. Indeed, I'm more and more convinced that we can't, but more on that later. As you might imagine, the medieval Mediterranean was a space characterized by flashy displays of difference and diversity particularly at the three geographical flashpoints of what, of what Gibbon called in his meta-narrative the world's debate, quoting Shakespeare, the supposedly perennial struggle between East and West. The first of these is the Iberian Peninsula, now comprising Spain and Portugal, which experienced a resurgence of Christian Muslim warfare beginning in the mid-11th century, culminating most spectacularly in the Christian conquest of Toledo in 1085. Though Christian expansion into the Muslim South was periodically stymied by new waves of conquerors from North Africa, first the Almoravids in 1086, and then the Almohads in the 1140s. Sicily, an unambiguously Muslim territory since the 10th century, 
It too experienced an uptick in Christian aggression in the middle 11th century with the coming of the Normans in 1060 to the island. Uh, and they subsequently conquered the entire island a by a generation later by 1091. Finally, the Levant, uh, Syria, Palestine, and Egypt, since the late 11th century had been divided by the Seljuk Turks and their enemies, the Fatimids of Egypt. This is the classic zone of the classic idea of the Crusades. At the turn of the century and in many waves thereafter, Frankish Crusaders established a number of kingdoms in their midst, and enterprising Muslim warlords used the, the Franks, that is, the Latin Christians from the West, as a pretext for creating their own frontier empires. Among them, Zengi of Aleppo, the Ayyubid dynasty founded by Saladin, and the Mamluk dynasty, which in 1291 finally ousted the last crusaders from Syria. So, I'm covering here uh, trends in historical writing from Spain to Syria from around 1100 to around 1300. No problem. <laughs> For all the differences on the map, historians emanating from this context were in broad agreement about the importance of doing history. Namely, that it provided examples of how God works his will through our kings. And thus we can learn from contemplating their deeds. As the Chronicle of, em of em the Emperor Alfonso, written for uh, the Spanish King Alfonso VII, put it, for as much as the record of past events, which is composed by historians and handed down to posterity in writing, makes the memory of kings, emperors, counts, nobles, and other heroes live anew, I have resolved that the best thing I can do is to describe the deeds of the emperor Alfonso, in particular those things which omnipotent God worked through him and with him, so that the salvation of the people of Christ in the midst of the earth might be achieved. These are sentiments echoed rather closely by the 13th century chronicler, Muslim chronicler, Ibn al-Athir, on the opposite end of the Mediterranean, who emphasized that knowing events through studying history, quote, is like being present when they took place, the better to derive lessons of statecraft and political theory, and most importantly, of the ineffability of God's will. Writing history, then, if it needs to be said, was not, at least not exclusively, about providing a transparent record of the past, as we might like to think. Moreover, Muslim and Christian historians also agreed on how to write history, and that's what this paper is really about. Both adapting the chronological narrative to their needs, either as a chronicon, a chronicle, or tzedid, and, along with it, they shared many other formal aspects and techniques within their narratives, the way they shaped their histories sometimes physically on the page, such as the use of a broad thematic overture or preface known as a harangue or arenga in Spanish chronicles or a muqaddam or introduction, presentation in Arabic chronicles. The, de the deployment of long and highly fictionalized set piece speeches, the insertion of documents, so you have that in quotes here, into the text and liberal pepperings of quotations or allusions to scriptures are also very common features. They also often use the same repeated plot devices, the same tropes or topoi, to teach the same lessons. Here I think it is important to distinguish between what we might call stylistic tropes in these narratives and um, uh, thematic tropes. By stylistic tropes, I mean those small repeated symbols or details that our authors use to color their narratives, spice them up, but which do not bear heavily on the moral lessons that are being taught. They are, for most intents and purposes, plot devices, decorative and abundant. Here, for example, we might cite the frequency by which, apparently, letters detailing attack plans are intercepted and altered, or the penchant of tyrants to invite their enemies to dinner and then murder them when their guard is down. It happens all the time. What I call the Last Supper motif, <laughs> and so on. By thematic tropes, I mean those repeated narrative devices that serve to explain something, victory or defeat usually, to make sense of trauma and of change, to provide examples which might, which might teach lessons and which reveal so much about the cultural values of our authors. They are thus, to my mind, far more interesting. I'm going to rehydrate it. 
Perhaps the most common thematic trope is one immediately recognizable to anyone who has read a medieval text and can be found in instances so numerous that I hesitate uh, to quote any. Namely, the notion that invasion and defeat are a punishment for our sins. Something we feel in Philadelphia all the time. <laughs> This is how the Christians of the Near East explained the ease uh, with which the Muslims captured Byzantine and Persian lands in the 7th century, how the Muslims and Christians of Al-Andalus, Sicily, and the Near East explained their losses to each other in the 11th and onward, and how the Jews of the Rhineland explained the massacres committed upon their communities in 1096. It is, of course, the logical explanation to choose if you accept the premise that yours is, as we do in Philadelphia, a chosen people which each of the three monotheist communities of the Mediterranean did. If your victories are achieved through God's design, your defeats must be too, as a test, perhaps, or a punishment. Thus, for example, when the bloody-minded King Alfonso I, El Batalador, the battler, King of Aragon and Navarre, besieged the Muslim-held town of Fraga in 1134, he refused to accept the Muslim offer of surrender because, as the Christian author of, of uh, a chronicle put it, using a phrase straight out of Exodus, God had hardened his heart in order that all the harm he had inflicted upon the Christians in the land of Leon and Castile should fall upon himself and upon his own people. And when Alfonso died shortly after this failed siege, his nobles exclaimed in despair, on account of the weight of our sins, the wrath of God fell upon us so that we would lose the liberator of the Christians. Now the impious Saracens, the Muslims, and our enemies will invade us. That, one lands, that one's lands were lost to the enemy through sin also goes a long way to explaining the redemptive language that surrounds the great reconquerors of the age, like Alfonso or Saladin. Their reclaiming of lost territory was a communal expiation of the sins that had lost them in the first place. For all involved, the vagaries of warfare were an opportunity to reflect on the inscrutable will of God, or fate, the two are basically the same. Consider, if you will, these two accounts, the first Christian, the second Muslim. In the first, Count, Rigo, uh, Count uh, Rodrigo Martinez of Leon found himself in 1138 climbing one of the wooden siege towers that he and uh, his buddy, King Alfonso VII, were using to strangle the Muslim-held city of Coria into submission. Here, I'll just quote the chronicle. Then, a certain Saracen shot an arrow by chance towards the siege tower, which the Count had climbed. Alas, in payment for the Count's sins, the arrow struck through the framework of the siege tower. The shaft lodged in the frame, but the iron head was separated from the wood, and penetrating his helmet and hauberk, it struck the Count's neck and wounded him. Poor lamb. I think you all know where this is headed. As a result of this small and random wound, wound, he died, as, quote, neither the skill of sorcerers nor doctors could staunch the blood. As a result of this misfortune, the chroniclers tell us, the Christians lifted the siege. The Muslim account comes from the Book of Contemplation of Usama ibn Munqid, which Michael mentioned. In 1123, on the other end of the Mediterranean, a Muslim ruler uh, named Mahmoud ibn Karaja, who was the Turkish lord of the Syrian city of Hama, uh, was working with Usama and his family in an attack, strangely similar attack, on the Frankish-held city of Apamea, so an ancient Greek city which was, at this point, uh, in the hands of the Crusaders. Despite the fact that Mahmoud kept himself at a safe distance during the siege, quote, an arrow... Uh, an arrow flew from the citadel and struck him on the side of his forearm bone. Yet it did not pierce the arm bone so much as the length of a barley grain. Mahmoud was obliged to withdraw, and the rest of the, Muslim, uh, rest of the Muslim troops soon followed. A few days later, his hand turned black, he lost consciousness, and died. This all happened to him simply because his time, his time had come. These arrows of fate seem to have a suspicious taste for kings and lords, Muslim sources, for example, are unanimous that Godfrey of uh, Bouillon, the first ruler of the Frankish kingdom of Jerusalem, was killed by just such a fateful arrow wound at Acre in 1100. Yet contemporary Christian sources are equal, equally unanimous that he died after a long illness. We'll come back to the implications of such a discrepancy later. 
fate as an expression of God's will was unpredictable, yet also unavoidable. An, an impregnable fortress, as Osama put it, in one of his own musings on the subject. But oath-making was a common and socially sanctioned way of bargaining with fate. To Christians and Muslims of the Mediterranean, oaths, of course, were promises sworn upon, typically, one's honor or the truth of one's religion. And so they were not to be taken lightly. Thus, to be able to make a lie out of an enemy's oath was not merely poking fun, but a direct attack on their honor and legitimacy. It is for this reason that the 11th century Castilian warlord named Rodrigo Diaz, a.k.a. El Cid, uh, played with such uh, sweaty aplomb by Charlton Heston in 1961 movie, some of you may remember, is said to have raced to conquer the disputed fortress of Monzon near Zaragoza. He had heard that, he, he didn't want the fortress, but he had heard that his enemy, the Christian king Sancho of Aragon, had sworn an oath that he would never dare, that Rodrigo would never dare to do such a thing. But of course, in this honor bond world, in so swearing, Sancho had practically begged Rodrigo to do it. So he did. Oaths were so sacred and potent to our Muslim sources that they, above all others, pay special heed to the fates of those wicked at heart enough to break them. The most famous example of this is the oath-breaking Frankish lord of Reynaud of Châtillon, sometime prince of Antioch. It was he who, in 1187, was famously captured with the king of Jerusalem himself by Saladin during the Battle of Hattin, a decisive Muslim victory that opened the way for the reconquest of Jerusalem and much else besides. One of Saladin's biographers has the sultan giving him a crisp dressing down. How often have you made a vow and broken your oath? How many obligations have you failed to honor? How many treaties made and unmade, agreements reached and repudiated? When Saladin finally killed him with his own hand, the captive king of Jerusalem, who was sitting awkwardly nearby, began quaking in terror before the sultan. At this, Saladin is said to have assuaged his fears, telling him, this man's evil deeds have been his downfall, and as you saw, his perfidy had been his destruction. He died for his sins and his wickedness. But the one place where God's plans became most clear to humanity was in dreams. It was in dreams that future actions could be predicted and past deeds given meaning and validated. Perhaps the best known episode involving dreams is that of the, mir the miracle of the Holy Lance that took place at the Frankish siege of Antioch in 1098 during the First Crusade. According to Frankish sources, one of the members of the Crusader camp began having visions of St. Andrew, who indicated that the Holy Lance, which Christian tradition held had been used to pierce the side of Christ while he was crucified, was to be found buried in Antioch's Cathedral of St. Peter, and would provide them with victory. A lance was indeed discovered, and the miraculous discovery of the relic is said to have galvanized the Franks at their darkest hour. The one Muslim source that mentioned this episode is understandably less convinced, and depicts it all as a cunning ruse to rally the troops. For our Christian authors, however, this episode fit very tightly within the genre of a revelatio, or discovery narrative, surrounding a saint's relics, familiar to any reader of saints' lives, and to the living audience then in 1098 in Antioch. Such dream visions were also a common source of Muslim miracle stories, though not, of course, in tales explaining the discovery of relics. They were particularly into relics in the same way that our Latin Christians were. More often, for all our authors, dreams existed to reveal secrets or esoteric knowledge, or to predict the future. Literarily, for all our authors, they existed as a device with which to provide heaven's stamp of approval on a given act of conquest. A Christian conquest from the uh, Historia Silense has a Greek pilgrim from Jerusalem newly arrived in Compostela the great Spanish pilgrim center devoted to St. James. After the pilgrim, who spoke only Greek, spent some time in Compostela, he began to understand what Western pilgrim, pilgrims were saying about St. James and his virtues. And he indulged in private doubts and quietly mocked the saint, who he told himself was no true knight, and had never even sat astride a horse as far as he knew. Later that night, a vision of the saint appeared to disabuse him of such notions. The Apostle James appeared to him, holding, as it were, keys in his hand, and with a cheerful expression said to him, Yesterday, 
mocking the devout intercessions of the people praying, you believe that I had never been a very valiant knight. Poof, a miraculous white horse appears. The apostle mounted the horse and displaying the keys to the pilgrim, informed him that the city of Coimbra in Portugal, many miles away, would surrender to King Fernando on the following morning. Upon awakening, upon awakening the, the, the Greek pilgrim told everyone he could about this vision. Soon messengers were sent, and upon arriving at the king's camp at Coimbra, they discovered that the city had, as you might have guessed, just been captured. Thus, the chronicle concludes, was the frenzy of the Moors driven out of Portugal. Divine sanction could also be granted through other kinds of miracles, too. Just as St. James provided advance warning to the doubting monk about King Fernando's victory at Coimbra, so too did God provide the scoop to his faithful in Muslim accounts immediately, uh, to, in Muslim accounts. Immediately upon the heels of the disastrous 1119 Frankish defeat in Syria at the so-called Agra Sanguinis, or Field of Blood, it is said that as the Muslims of Aleppo were assembling for midday prayer, a great and mysterious groan was heard emanating from the western horizon, that is, from the general vicinity of the, uh, of the battle site many, many miles away, signaling the victory many hours before the first messengers even had arrived back to bring news to the city. Similarly, when the Norman king of Sicily gloated to a Muslim ascetic in his court about a recent victory on the African coast, he asks of him, what use is Muhammad now to his land and people? But the man quietly responded, he wasn't there. He was at Edessa, which the Muslims have just taken. The, the Franks present all thought it was a memorable jest until a boat arrived a few days later to tell the king that the city had indeed fallen. Still other miraculous visions offered no words or predictions, but spoke volumes nonetheless, such as the army of angelic horsemen who are said to have appeared to assist the Franks in their utter rout of the Muslim army outside Antioch in 1098, or in a nice counterpoint uh, in the Muslim sources, the captured Frankish knight in one account uh, about the field of blood. This man, led in chains by a feeble, unarmed soldier, was mocked by the Muslim onlookers for having been captured by such a weakling. But it wasn't him, the Frank protested, but another warrior who captured him. The man who captured me was a great man, larger and stronger than I, and he handed me over to this fellow. He wore a green robe and rode a green horse, which was, a, which was to the audience of this Muslim text, a clear allusion to the mystical green-clad heroes of Muslim apocalyptic lore known as the Abdal. In each case, through the validation of dreams and apparitions that only heaven could send, each side could claim that God had their back. But chronicles, as their authors and titles so frequently proclaim, were properly concerned with the deeds of kings. Chronicles then acted at least partly as a sort of mirror for princes, dispensing lessons on models of kingship and proper governance for their audience. Certainly the clearest lesson, harped on repeatedly by authors Christian and Muslim, and, lean, and leaned upon heavily as an explanatory device, by them, and by the way, by modern historians too, is the lesson that political disunity is perilous. The very first reference to the Crusades by a Muslim author, a preacher named Asulami, explicitly provides a historical context that contrasted the early centuries of Islamic history with the fragmented situation of his own day. In particular, he described Islam's early centuries as a sort of golden age in which Muslims were politically and spiritually united, and in which Muslim leaders rigorously exercised the duty of jihad against Islam's enemies. But then something went wrong. Increasingly concerned with affairs of this world, as Sulami argued, Muslim rulers began to fight amongst one another and to let the duty of, the duty of jihad fall into abeyance. As a result, a group of the enemy attacked the island of Sicily, while its inhabitants disputed and competed with one another. And in the same way, they took possession over one city after another in Al-Andalus. When reports confirmed for them that this country, Syria, suffered from disagreements between its masters and the ignorance of its lords, they confirmed their resolution to set out for it, and Jerusalem was their heartfelt goal. They looked out over Syria and saw scattered kingdoms, discordant hearts, and a hidden <clears throat> mutual loathing. And because of that, their ambitions became stronger and extended to all they surveyed. They did not stop striving steadily in jihad against the Muslims. 
for assumably looking back from Damascus with the whole swath of Islamic history, the events of the First Crusade, which is what he's describing here, were not just a story about Syria and Palestine, but rather about the entire abode of Islam. These Frankish invasions were a trial sent by God, a punishment for Muslims having let the duty of jihad lapse. But its most proximate cause was the weakness and division of the Muslim community, a community that had become fragmented spiritually as well as politically. Such division and infighting that consumed the lands of Islam made them all too tempting to the Franks who dwelt on their northern limits. And so they passed, first on Sicily, then on Al-Andalus, that's Muslim Spain, and later on Syria and Palestine. Significantly, this earliest of all Muslim observers of the Crusaders knows holy war when he sees it and qualifies the Franks' campaigns against Islamdom not just as a tax, as garden variety warfare, but as jihad, making them, infidels all, avid prosecutors of the spiritual duty that his fellow Muslims had long ago decided to ignore. <clears throat> Assumi was not the only one who blamed the Frankish victories of the early Crusades on Muslim disunity. Indeed, it is a theme harped upon many times by many authors, among them Ibn al-Athir, one of the main narrative sources of the whole period. In writing history, he, sort of refreshingly, wears his politics on his sleeve. While the Franks, goddamn them, <laughs> were conquering and settling in a part of the territories of Islam, the rulers and the armies of Islam were fighting amongst themselves causing discord and disunity among their people and weakening their power to combat the enemy. Christian chroniclers, for their part, routinely blamed the disasters confronting their lands on the divisiveness, divisiveness, divisiveness of their rulers, too. In the interest of time, I'll give you one example that, uh, uh, from another Muslim source um, uh, uh, in which um, disunity uh, plays a, a role. Um, he cites a, an eyewitness source that he interviewed, um, a Frankish prisoner captured during the Third Crusade, who told him <coughs> that he was his mother's only son, and their house was their sole possession. But she had sold it and used the money obtained from it to equip him and go to free Jerusalem. There he had been taken prisoner. Such, he reflects, the Muslim author, such were the religious and personal motives that drove the Franks on. They flocked to battle by any means they could, by land and sea, from all directions. If God had not shown his grace to Islam in the death of the German king, Conrad, who had died on the way, it would, have, it would have been said one day that Syria and Egypt had once been Muslim lands. So he sort of uh, praises Frankish unity, the ability of the Franks to mobilize their people as a way of shaming um, what he saw as the problem of Muslim disunity in his own day. Related to the trope of disunity is what we might call the motif of the enemy within. Surely one of the most common motifs in all our sources, Muslim and Christian, not just because these events actually happened, I'm sure they did, but because of their literary power. In these accounts, disaster is caused by disunity, but disunity is given a face. Someone within our own society has invited the agents of our own destruction. In effect, such narratives provide later, later generations with a fall guard. Thus, it is Count Julian who invites the first Muslim armies across the strait from Morocco into Spain to assist him in his own civil war. It is a Muslim warlord named Ibn al-Thumna who invites the Normans into Sicily to assist him in his own civil war. It is the Muslim lord of Seville who invites the Almoravids into Spain in 1086 to fight Alfonso VI, the Byzantine emperor, or perhaps the Fatimids, who invited the Crusaders into Syria in 1099, and so on. As with whole kingdoms, so too with individual towns and cities, whose inhabitants were also depicted as including potential fifth columnists, most famously at Muslim-held Antioch during the First Crusade, where a Greek, or Persian, or Armenian, Muslim, or Christian, soldier, or armor maker, was bribed, or volunteered, to let the Crusaders sneak over the city walls and open the gates. So powerful was the trope of the enemy within at explaining loss that in the Mamluk period, late in the 13th century, the conquest of Tripoli over 150 years earlier 
was remembered as being caused by the local ruler apostatizing and letting, you know, converting to Christianity and letting the Crusaders in. In fact, if the Medieval Chronicle had done his research uh, in the work of his colleagues, as contemporary Muslim and Christian sources all agree, the city had been taken uh, by force. It had never been surrendered. Time to conclude. Now, it might be countered that perhaps I'm being unfair in dismissing the events that I've described here as mere tropes or topol, uh, after, you know, uh, repeated devices that occur. After all, political divisiveness, for example, is a likely source of weakness and ants defeat. You can see how it makes sense, politics aside. Who is to say this isn't an accurate explanation of what actually happened, right? Uh, Albrecht Note, who more than any other person made the, made the use of the word topos a commonplace in the study of Islamic historiography, uh, you can generally distinguish uh, Arabists who have read Note by the frequency by which this word appears in cocktail party conversation. <laughs> he liked to distinguish between topoi of life and topoi of texts. Sometimes life is, indeed, very repetitive, and so the common occurrence of, say, men on horses in our texts shouldn't excite our attention as students of historiography. But with the tropes I've described today, my point is not that they did not happen, many of them demonstrably did. But my point is that for our authors, defeat and victory had to be explained by one totalizing cause, one moral failing or blessing, one God-protected hero, one traitor. But as we all know from our own experiences, life is messy. History is messy. And so our authors chose one explanation, perhaps this cause, perhaps that, but always at the expense of other explanations that might have been offered, and always with literary rather than historical factors influencing their choice. What counts as a sufficient explanation for our authors isn't necessarily so for us as historians. And yet we routinely parrot the tropical explanations of our medieval authors as if they were satisfactory. But let me offer a clear example from some Muslim authors about what I mean. In the build-up to the Great Battle of Hattin in 1187, in which the forces of the Sultan Saladin crushed the army of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, the Franks had arranged a sort of summit meeting in Sephoris, a town not far from Hattin, where they considered their options about confronting Saladin, whether war was the only course, and if so, how to pursue it. For the chronicler Ibn al-Athir, this was an opportunity to demonstrate the failure of the Franks by depicting their forces as divided and disloyal, particularly in the figure of King Raymond of Tiberius, who had been an ally of Saladin, but was now depicted as returning to the Frankish fold. This perhaps also made them seem like easy pickings. Since Ibn al-Athir loathed Saladin, I wouldn't put it past him to spin the story that way. Yet Ibn al-Athir's contemporary, Saladin's biographer, who you know, was part of his job description to love Saladin, uh, his name was Amanda Dean, he depicts the summit meeting in exactly the opposite fashion as a cabal of Frankish leaders warmly and unanimously deciding to march out at once against Saladin. Here, too, this works in Saladin's favor, since it heightens the miracle of his victory, even over, even over an enemy that was so united, right? It can go both ways. But which one is closer to the truth? The first one, where they're divided, or the second one, where they're united? Both? I would argue that neither are. These different accounts of the same event reflect the rhetorical needs of our authors, our medieval authors not two empirical perspectives on actual events. And by contrast, the occurrence of the same trope in different historical traditions, say Latin and Arabic, do not necessarily independently confirm each other. So when you, if both stories were uh, both accounts about divided Franks, would, that, would they confirm one another as historical truth, or would they just be multiple versions of the same literary device? So recognizing a trope when it is being deployed can lead us then to better understand the text and maybe the events it purports to describe. But the problem is that identifying tropes requires a kind of broad reading in the sources, which you know, I do not claim to have done here, which the increasingly siloed and specialized nature of the field of medieval history militates against. We're all in our little uh, bailiwick. We are trained more and more to be masters of less and less. And as a result, the Michael Lowers of the world are a rare commodity. But historians of the medieval Mediterranean who do read broadly can help the rest of us remember that the stories 
that so intrigue us in our sources might very likely be nothing but building blocks in a bigger story. For in deploying tropes like divine tests, oaths, visions, disunity, and treason within to explain the past, medieval Christians and Muslims were unwittingly constructing a very similar meta-narrative to one another, a story about the stories they tell. While they might disagree about who the protagonists were, both Christians and Muslims were totally agreed that God worked his plan through the history of his people, that miracles and visions sometimes gave us a glimpse of it, and that kings, properly guided by the pious, were the agents of his present and future will. This does not bode well for our attempt to dip into the narratives in search of useful nuggets of hard evidence with which to defend a thesis. But it does bode well for another realm of inquiry, one that focuses on our authors and considers them as serious and original writers and clever craftsmen, as amateurs and masters of a kind of literary artifice, which we call history writing, common to every shore of the medieval Mediterranean. Seen this way, the historical texts in Latin, Arabic, Hebrew, Greek, and everything else in between, which gave our predecessors so much trouble, might now be read not separately as solitary exemplars, but in unison as voices in a Mediterranean chorus, whose tune we haven't quite caught. Catching that tune in the other Mediterranean-wide patterns of history writing is something which the historians of wide horizons that flock to places like the Institute for Advanced Study here and God help us, the students that they train are unite, uniquely capable of doing. But that's for another paper. <laughs>